our Lord and Savior, Redeemer and King, to the praise of the Holy Spirit, our source of light and life. Let all believers say Amen. 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 Lift up your hairs, all you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors. The response will be that the King of Glory may come in. That the King of Glory may come in. Who is this King of Glory? The response will be the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your head, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors. The response will be that the King of Glory may come in. That the King of Glory may come in. Who is he, the King of Glory? And the response will be, the Lord Almighty, he is the King of Glory. The Lord Almighty, he is the King of Glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. The response will be, as it was in the beginning, as it was in the beginning, it's now, it's now, and ever shall be, and ever shall be, word without end, word without end. Amen. Amen. We will read from. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, "Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not." And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillow and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Lourdes at the first. Verse 22. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be called God's house. And of all that you shall give me, I will surely give the tenth unto you. Amen. 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 Uh, at this point, I will let the Ketika present the key to me. Thank you very much. I receive it in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Brethren, since by the grace of God and under his good providence, this house of worship has been acquired that it may be set apart for its proper use as a house of the Lord, dwelling place of God's glory, for God's glory, and a house of prayer for his people. We now open these doors in the name of God, the Father and Creator, God the Son, and our Savior, and God, the Holy Spirit, and giver of life. Let all believers say, Amen. Amen. Peace be to this house and to all who enter there. The Lord bless our coming in and our going out from this time forward and forever. Let believers say, I was glad, I was glad. When, they to me. when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Then now, no congregation is coming.
place where your presence dwell and your glory is revealed as we use it to prepare your people for the abundant life here which you have promised but as well for the life that is to come for all eternity may these people continue to praise and worship in spirit and in truth as we consecrate ourselves this day to building your kingdom through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The book of Samuel. Second Samuel chapter 6, verse, verse 1 to 5. Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 1 to 5. Now David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Bali Judah to bring out from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who is a throne above the shaman. They placed the ark of God on a new cart, that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ayo, the son of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. So they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab. Which was, which was on the hill, and I was walking ahead of the ark. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of firewood, and with lace, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. I take the last stanza again. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of firewood, and we place harps, tambourines, casting it, and cymbals in the land. This is the word of the Lord. Our second Bible reading shall be taken from Ephesians chapter 1, 3 to 14. Ephesians chapter 1, 3 to 14. Shall we listen to the word of the Lord? Praise for spiritual blessings in Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. Glorious grace, through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through, the, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. 
With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he, which he purposed in Christ, to be, put into, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to be put to put our hope in Christ might be the might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until, until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. Day by day, 
dear, we magnify thee. And we worship thy name. And we and we worship thy name without end. For save, O Lord. For save, O Lord, to keep, keep us today without, without sin. O oh Lord, have mercy. Oh Lord, have mercy. Find me, never be called from Gospel from Mark chapter 6, 14 to 29. Gospel, Mark chapter 6, 14 to 29. And King Herod heard of it, for his name had become well known, and people were saying, John the Baptist has risen from the dead, and therefore these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others were saying, he's Elijah, and others were saying, he's a prophet, like one of those prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he kept saying, John, whom I beheaded, he had risen. For Herod himself had went and had John arrested and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of the brother Philip, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him and could not do so. For Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was very perplexed, but used to enjoy his listening to him. And strategic day came, when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet, for his laws and military commanders and leading men of Galilee. And when the daughter of Herodias himself came and danced, she pleased her, she pleased him and his dinner guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you. And he swore to her, whatever you ask of me, I will give it to you, up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And immediately she came and hissed before the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me the right to give me right away the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And although the king was very sorry, yet because of his oath and because of his dinner guest, he was unwilling to refuse her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded him to bring back the head. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girls gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard about this, they came and took the body away and laid it in the tomb. The word. Thanks. 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 And will let us pray. Almighty God, we lift our hearts and voices and thanks giving praise and adoration to you for who you are and what you continue to do in our lives and what we believe you do in the times ahead for us. We thank you for an opportunity like this to come into your presence, dedicate a house for your worship, sing to the praise and glory of your name and hear your word, that word which enlightens the darkness in our world and give us hope 
the word upon which we build our lives so that the <clears throat> storms of life will never destroy our lives. We come into your presence at this time and pray, O oh God, that you take control of our hearts and minds. That as your word comes to us in the might of your Holy Spirit, you find a place within us. And it will sprout, germinate, and grow, and bear fruit to the honor and glory for him. So, Lord, we commit this entire gathering to your hands. If there is any spirit here, we say to your spirit, and who will not allow us to proclaim your word or hear your word so we can live it out to glorify your name? We send that spirit away from within us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I ask you to take control, but at all things to your glory and honor, so that at the end of it all, we will have cause to say that indeed we came into your presence and you have blessed us. We thank you for your announcement our praise. Because we have prayed in that name which is above every other name, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. 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 Beloved, we all know that salvation is free. Absolutely free. Completely free. Right? But once you accept that salvation that God gives in Christ, It has a cost to it. In a sense, you surrender everything you are and have. Because you cannot accept the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ and begin living the way you want to live. So salvation is free. At no expense to you. But once you receive it, you have committed everything you are and have to Jesus Christ. You are no longer your own. Let me try to explain it practically. Assuming you want to go to your home country, wherever you come from, you don't have the means of buying a ticket. Fortunately for you, you have a friend who has a private jet. That friend invites you, come, I'll take you free of charge. You don't have to pay anything. Once you accept that free offer, you commit your whole life into the hands of that person, right? <clears throat> if he flies well, you are saved. If he crashes, what happens to you? <laughs> the same thing it is with salvation. It is absolutely free. God invites us in Jesus Christ to come and live a kind of life that is glorious. But once we accept that, there is a cost to it. What we are seeing in effect is that we are no longer our own. As for you Methodists, you know this already. Every first Sunday in the year, you, you renew your covenant with God. And one of the things you tell God is that, Lord, I am no longer my own. I belong to you wholeheartedly. And so that is what the theme today is asking us to consider. The cost of being a follower of Jesus Christ. The cost of discipleship. When we look at our first lesson, the reading from Second Samuel, from the Old Testament to us, we are told that David, after his con he conquered Jerusalem, Jerusalem was a city of the Jebusites. It wasn't part of Israel, but David led the army of Israel to conquer the city of Jerusalem and make it the capital of the Israelite nation. So when he had conquered Jerusalem, he moved the ark, the dwelling place of God, into Jerusalem, so that God will be at the center of the lives of his people. You know, the ark, if you read the <clears throat> book of Exodus, it was God who commanded Moses to fashion that ark. God gave the dimensions and everything. So when they were moving, the ark was with them. And when they said come, they put it into a tabernacle. So sometimes it's referred to as the ark of the tabernacle. But it's a symbol of the presence of God in the midst of his people. And so what I want us to know is that the first thing 
the first thing, if you want to be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple of Christ, the cost is to have Jesus Christ at the center of your life. Amen. To absolutely surrender to God. You don't decide what to do, where to go. Jesus decides that for you because you are no longer your own. Scripture tells us that Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead so that those of us who were, who were supposed to die, for which he died, we will no longer live for ourselves, but we live for him. So the first cause of being a disciple of Jesus Christ is that you don't decide where to work, you don't decide what to eat. You don't decide when to come to church or not. Whether you have to come or not. But it is God who decides everything for you. So ideally, in your daily life, when you wake up in the morning and devote a section of your time to God, you need to ask God, what do you want me to do today? What is it that, Lord, you want me to do today? I should have that position. I am the person who should have it. You see, but if you want to be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, it is not about you, it's about God. It's Amen. about Christ. Amen. What is it that Christ wants me to do? So uh, David moved the act. If, if we had continued reading that text, or if we had read about two chapters back, we found out that the act <coughs> was taken by the Philistines in a battle. And for seven months, the act was being moved from one city of the Philistines to another. Because where, wherever, <laughs> in whatever city the act is moved, God sent a plague to destroy the people. So they, at long last, they said, well, no, we don't need the ark. Take your ark. They sent it back to, <clears throat> to Israel. And even when the ark was being moved, remember the man who, when the, it, it, it seemed as if the ark was falling and he wanted to protect the ark, what happened to him? Why? The text did not tell us. But I am tempted to think that because other people also touch the ark, but nothing happened to them. But I'm tempted to believe that the inner attitude of that person wasn't right before God. Sometimes we 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 doubt the, the mercies of God, the presence of God with us, but we forget that that God who delights to come to live among us, sinful though we are, is also a God who is holy. Amen. Holy other, completely apart from us. And so sometimes when we go to him in that kind of hypocritical attitude, God will react because he's a God of holiness. He's holy other, completely different from us. I cannot be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ come into his temple like we are now, worship with my brother and my sister, and not talk to him. I am a hypocrite. If I claim to love God, and I hate the brother I see every moment of my life, I am a hypocrite. And one of these days, God is going to strike us dead. I was told the other day that uh, <clears throat> the God we read about in the Bible at the time was a young God. Now he's quite too old, so he doesn't do the things he used to do. But my Bible tells me that <laughs> today and tomorrow. So whenever we attempted to come into the presence of God with unholy attitude, we need to think again. Because, yes, God is merciful. God is loving. But the same God, you know, 
has a kind of wrath that is so, so, I don't know how to describe it. If you read the book of Revelation, at a point in time, the kings of the earth were running away to hide from the wrath of God. And you know, you know what they did? They went to mountains and hills and asked the mountains to fall on them, to cover them from the wrath of God. That is the nature of our God. He's, he's, he's loving, but he judges people. You know. Today we've dedicated a place, a house of worship to the Lord. We want the presence of God to be here at all times. If that is what we desire, then we also need to purify ourselves. Because that God we want to live in this temple is the God who calls us to be holy because he is also holy. He's the God who calls us to be perfect because he is also perfect. Sometimes people tend to think that, well, in this world we cannot be perfect. In this world we cannot be holy. What are we saying? That God doesn't know who we are. If God knows who we, God knows exactly who we are, and that same God calls us to be perfect, it presupposes that God has provided the means for us to be perfect, the means for us to be holy. So my brother, my sister, the first cost of being a disciple, an authentic disciple of Christ, is to have God at the center of our lives. And because God is at the center of our lives, there are certain things we no longer have to entertain in our lives. Apostle Paul will say that for those of us who are in Christ, we have become new creations. The old things no longer apply because we have become completely new. The Spirit of God has given us back into the family of God. So we are new creation. And that is the kind of people who genuinely, genuinely wants to be the disciples of Christ. It has a cost to it. And we must be prepared to pay the cost. In our second reading from the epistles, the Apostle Paul, his epistle to the Ephesians, is making us aware of the fact that all of us who have responded positively to God's invitation to salvation in Christ have been chosen by God, have been redeemed by God, have been forgiven by God, <laughs> we have been sealed with the mark of God unto the day of reckoning. We have been redeemed. And all this were given to us, not because we deserve, not because we've done something to merit these things from God, not because we've even gone to God and cried, God, we need this, so give it to us. But at the time God gave these things to us, you know, we have nothing to commend us to. And for the Apostle Paul, it was before the foundation of the world, before you were born, God knew you and chose you, forgave you, redeemed you, sealed you with the mark for salvation in Jesus Christ, before the foundations of the world. So, you know, when I walk about and people talk about me, people... <clears throat> People insult me, I don't mind, I don't care. Because the almighty God, the powerful God, the omnipotent God, chose me just as I am, before I was born. Yes. So who are you? Yes. If you insult me, why should I waste time exchanging words with you? I'd rather use that time to worship my God. Amen. Amen. Because at the time we were redeemed, Paul will tell us, we were sinful. We have nothing to commend us to God. You see? And because of that, when I stand here to proclaim the message, I see it as a, as a privilege. It is not a fact that I'm better than any of you here. 
but at this very moment, this very time, God has chosen me to proclaim his word. And that makes me humble. Because God can choose any one of us. You know, if you read scriptures carefully, you find out asses talk, right? Isaiah will tell us that sometimes the mountains clap for joy because of what God is doing. And David will say that God has ordained praises in the mouth of infants. Then you see somebody do something slight to you. Do you know who I am? Are you my co God? <laughs> <laughs> who are you? A sinner saved by grace. Amen. That is the kind of thing you need to know. So that when you are tempted to, 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 to present yourself as something you are not, you know, the Spirit will quickly remind you that. You know, but for grace, you are nothing. That recognition is also a cause for us because the world in which we live, you know, celebrates people who are able to come forward. I am number one. I have, I have this, I have that, I have that. I ought to be this. Those are the people the world celebrates. So when John the Baptist came about that, was eating locusts and wearing camels here. Nobody recognized him. But Jesus will tell you that of all people who have been born of a woman, no one is greater than John in the kingdom of God. But in the world, he's a nobody. Right? There are some of us here. If Jesus was to come right now, you know, they will be called first. And some of us will be shocked because we don't consider them even to be Christian, let alone be <laughs> the kind of people who need to <laughs> dine with God at a banquet in heaven. Because God has done all things for us, all these things for us, it calls for celebration. You know, that is why when David brought the act to Jerusalem, he commissioned people to sing to the Lord. You know, if we are continually reading that just a little, we will realize that David danced and danced and danced and danced before the Lord. Even though he was the king of Israel, he realized that in the presence of God is nobody. God is the king. Amen. And so for us, our rejoicing should be said that people will know and come to ask of us, what is the source of your joy? And then we can point to the God who has made us that and invite them also to come and experience that kind of joy in Jesus Christ. Amen. And that is also costly. It is costly. Because it means that we don't rejoice just when we come into the house of the Lord. We rejoice wherever we find ourselves. You know, people will ridicule us. Remember, if you read the history of Methodism, one day, Wesley Brothers started um, this semi-monastic group in Oxford University. They were given all sorts of names. Bible moves, superrogation men, <laughs> Methodists, and all kinds of things. And then they decided that, well, if you've given us name, we want Methodist. So Methodist stopped. If you are in school and you, you belong to us, the scripture you know, no, um, the fellowship of our Christians, you are doing all sorts of them, especially, especially the ladies, the young girls. Some of them call them Holy Mary, Virgin Mary, and so on and so forth. So, you know, you are giving names to take you away 
from celebrating the presence of the Lord, celebrating the goodness of the Lord. And some of us, we yield easily. You know, we don't want to be ridiculed. And so we'll never speak about our Lord in our workplace and the communities in which we find ourselves. Because if we name the name of Jesus Christ, people will ridicule us. My dear Christian friends, as I said earlier in the beginning, salvation is free. But discipleship is costly. But you can't have salvation without being a disciple of Christ. Because the Christ who invites you to come to be saved is the same Christ who enjoins you to follow him every moment of your life. There is no other way. You know. <clears throat> there is no cheap price tag for discipleship. There is no discount for discipleship. No cutting of corners for discipleship. Either you follow Christ or you don't. I think I've said time and time again that in our relationship with God, there is no neutral point. You can't say, well, I don't belong to God, and I'm also, I don't belong to the enemy. I am here in the middle. There's no middle point. It's either you belong here or there. No middle point. That is the kind of life we've been called to live. Dear friends, it is difficult, but it is not impossible. Because the God who calls us also <coughs> strengthens us. So we can say with Paul, I can do all things through Christ. Is it true? Yes. Do we know from here or from here? <laughs> The other day, somebody was telling that. So, you know what? The greatest distance on earth is from here to here. Knowing something, you know, here, and letting it sink into here is the most difficult thing to do. But for those of us who know Christ as our Savior and our Lord, Christ strengthens us. Amen. You know, the God who began all this in, in us is able and willing and ready to accomplish it all. Amen. Well, at least that has been my experience with God. Maybe, if not, but that is the God that I worship. Amen. My dear Christian friends, let me... I decided to preach this service, but I'm not preaching this service. Because I want Super to invite me again and again to come here. <laughs> Coming to the third reading, that is where we pay the ultimate price. Herod Antipas is married to Herodias, who used to be the wife of Herod's brother, Philip. Antipas engineered for Herodias to divorce her husband, Philip, and to marry him. And then John said, Herod, you know, this is evil. John was speaking truth to power. And Herod did not take it kindly. Herodias heard of it, and he bore John a grudge. <clears throat> And to prevent John from spreading this, <laughs> this news across the nation, they put him in a dungeon. But those of us who have the faith of Christ, you know, in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword, we still sing about our faith. We still hold on to our faith. And we, we just sang a song, Faith of Our Fathers Living Still. In spite of what? 
Oh, you forgot it so soon, right here in the chapel. What about if you go out a day or two, three days? Faith of our fathers living still, in spite of dungeon, fire, and salt. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear that glory of the word. You know, the mark of the disciple, authentic disciple of Christ, is truth. No compromise. And so John went to Herod and said, you know what? What you've done is evil. You've taken your brother's wife and it is not right. And because of that, he was put into a dungeon. But I believe John was, uh, John was singing at that time. That no matter what, I will speak the truth. No matter what, I will live for the truth. No matter what, I will not compromise. Herodias hated John so much so that when her daughter danced before his father and the father made a reckless promise, the daughter went to Herodias. What should I ask my father to give? To ask for the head of John. My dear Christian friends, following Jesus, following Jesus Christ, being an authentic disciple of Christ may cause you to pay the ultimate sacrifice. You may have to seal your witness with your blood. And sometimes for fear of that, we compromise our faith. We say things that we don't have to say. We do things that we don't have to do. Because we are afraid to die. But who amongst us will never die? If you won't die, raise up your hand. Oh, I will not die. I will live till Jesus Christ come for us. And I'll be translated. Amen. And it's very soon. I'll live for 120 years and I'm getting there. Yes. <laughs> Shall we, for fear of feeble humanity, disown our Lord and our Redeemer, the one who has <clears throat> had mercy on us when we were nobodies, when people don't even mention our names? He stood low, came down to rescue us from the miry clay of sin and made us into the kind of people we are. Helps and joined us with Christ for the eternal riches of the Father in the kingdom. And then we are afraid of people so we compromise with the truth. To pay the truth. Do not speculate. No, do not spread falsehood about people. Sometimes, some of us ministers, before you go to your next station, all sort of things have been said about you. And when you go and the people experience you and come to know that what they heard is not what you are portraying, then they start coming to you. Also, before you came, uh, we were told that you are like this, but. After some time, we realize that it's not true. What are we looking for? What are we yearning for? What are the things that motivate us to do those things? If all of us will stand for the truth, our communities will be you know, joyous place, places where people will experience the kind of fellowship, brotherliness, sisterliness that is eluding us all. Sometimes you're talking to your brother, your sister, somebody is coming and you have to stop. Why? Because even though the person doesn't understand what you're saying, before you realize, 
it's all over the place. You said something you didn't say. Why? Well, I don't know. But maybe before I, I, I finish speaking, Jesus Christ will come. Amen. And when that happens, where will you be? When that happens, you know, one of these days when we go to heaven, I, well, because we've um, <clears throat> come out with technology, everything here, I believe the, the, the best of technologies is in heaven. Yes. So you go to that place, and God will say, well, I'm not going to say anything about you, but this is a video of your life. Are you guilty or innocent? <laughs> For me, I believe that when we get there, those who be condemned, be condemned by their own witness, not because God wants to condemn them, their lives, their st the statements they've made, the way they've conducted themselves, will condemn them. I don't believe that hell is for any human being. You know, if you read the Chi Bible, you know, the account Bible, we say, of oh, some you know, the fire of the devil. So it means that no human being will be sent there except the person chooses to go there on his or her own. And for many of us, our thoughts, our pronouncements, the way we act will send us to hell. God will not condemn anybody to hell, but we will condemn ourselves. So my friends, Following Jesus Christ comes with a cost. First, Jesus Christ wants you to make him the center of your life. He wants to be the pivot around which your life revolves. He will tolerate no rival. Either you are for him or you are against him. If you don't want to live for him, you don't accept his salvation, then you are free. When you accept that salvation in Jesus Christ, know for a fact that there is absolutely nothing on this earth or in heaven that can condemn you. If you don't condemn yourself because you've been chosen, you've been forgiven, you've been sealed with a mark of possession by God, you've been redeemed, you've been made a heir of God, there's nothing. And that calls for celebration for you to tell other people that there is some redemption in Christ, so come and experience it. Would that be too much for the Lord to ask of you? I think it was Isaac Watts who said, well, the whole realm of nature mind, that we are not afraid far too small. The kind of amazing love that God has demonstrated in Christ for us demands everything of us to be saved. He stands at the door of your heart and knocking. Open the door for him to come in so that together we we'll serve at the banqueting world of Christ. He is asking you to come. You know, the next moment might be too late. This is the day of salvation. There is no other place where people can be saved apart from this place. That is why, for some reason, you are here today. Surrender to Christ and live for Him so that you have that kind of living hope with which to inherit eternal life someday to come. Bow down your head and let's pray. Oh, to Jesus I surrender. Oh, to Him my free legacy.
continue to thank you, to praise you, to adore you for what you've done for us today. You've given us this house of worship and we dedicated it to your service. We pray that this sanctuary may be a place where when people come and they are sick, they will be healed before going home. When people come and they are losing their hope, you will restore their hope. You will strengthen the faith of people who come into this sanctuary. Let this place be a place, your dwelling place for us. When people come here, let them find salvation. Lord, we commit this place special into your hands. Pray that, Lord, let no soul who ever worship here be a child of perdition. Whoever comes here to listen to your word, Lord, let your Holy Spirit impress the word upon the tablet of his or her heart so that daily as he or she meditates upon your word, the person will have that living hope with which we inherit eternal life. As we live here, Lord, we are not live in your presence because you promised us that wherever we are, you are with us till the end of the age. Go with us everywhere we go, especially in our homes. Be present in our homes. Guide and guide us, support and keep us, sustain us and direct us in all that we do. Also in our workplace throughout the week, Lord, be with us. Give us what it takes to work for your glory and your glory only. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayers because we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And now may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and always. Amen. Amen. 715, 750.